D-Lo, ay, yeah, clutch. I'm in the clutch, we in the clutch, it's even been clutch. You think that we suck, your dreams are the luck, your ship is just sunk, we turn off a way. Ooh, yeah, see that my face is up in disgust because people talking a mess, but there's nothing to discuss. I'm just being honest, I'm keeping it a bug. Uh huh. We in the clutch! What's going down, clutch? Squat! What up, what up? It's your boy Duck. It's your boy True Billy. It's your boy Ross. And we are in the clutch. Hey, hey. yes, sir. Back to you, ladies and gentlemen, another video today, you feel me? Another Mr. Ballin' video. Our yes, three sir. top three stories that, will, that sound fake but are 100% real. This is part three. Can't wait till we get to part four. Yeah. <laughs> we'll probably end the series there, y'all. But it's been nice. Roll, roll, Appreciate roll, the first roll, three. Roll, roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it. Yeah. Shout out to the Undertaker being in the duck inducted yes, to the rest of the man. Shout out to Undertaker, man. Congrats. Congrats. All of fame. OG man, one He's of the fans. OG coming bro. Up, man. Uh, from Texas, man. From Texas. Yes, yeah, Texas. man. Be exact, I'm man. Houston, bro. Saying, baby, you know what I'm saying. But yeah, we're about to get into these. We know y'all loving these and enjoying them. And mm -hmm. if you're new to them. It has us glued as well, so let's get into it. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all Subscribe we do, and we man. upload three, four, please. even five right. times every week. So if screen, that's man. of interest to you, please ask the like button if they'd like to play Mario Kart with you on your N64. I like when that. they say yeah. yes, have them come over and then force them to use the broken Mad Cat's controller. Oh, also, please subscribe to our hey, channel and turn on all oh, notifications yeah. so you don't miss any and of our weekly uploads. Yeah. All oh. right, let's get into yeah. today's story. You ain't winning it. In October of 2002, Mark and his wife Kathy were on their way to a baby shower in Baltimore, Maryland ago, that was being held for them by Kathy's dude. family. It would be a seven hour drive from their home in Ohio, so Mark and Kathy tried to get out the door as early as possible, but one thing led to another and they got a pretty late start. By midnight, they were only about an hour away from their final destination, but they both desperately needed a bathroom break. And so they pulled into a rest stop in Frederick County, Maryland, which is about an hour outside of Washington, DC. The rest area parking lot was completely vacant except for one car, which was a dark blue late model four-door sedan that was parked head in right in front of the bathroom. Mark and Kathy pulled into a spot that was a few over from the sedan. They got out, they walked up to the restroom. Mark was done first, so he waited outside of the women's restroom for his wife. As he waited, he turned around to face the sedan that initially, when he first pulled in the lot, he believed was empty. But now, as he's looking at it, he can clearly see there are two people in the front two seats. A middle-aged man who's sitting behind the steering wheel looking directly at Mark, and then next to this guy is a sleeping teenager. And immediately, Mark felt really creeped out by these two guys. I mean, they are in this random rest stop in the middle of the night. They're the only ones there. And this guy is just staring menacingly at Mark. Hey, and so Mark's hey, doing his best to not to yep, be intimidated honey, and to on. stand his yep, ground, yep, not act phased by what's happening right in front of him. But in the back of his mind, he is just praying his wife comes out of that bathroom as soon as possible so There's they can me. get the heck out of here There's and away me. from these two creepy guys. Finally, his wife did come out. He grabbed her by the hand and without any explanation, Damn, yeah, rushed them back to the yeah, so. hopped in, locked the doors, oh, turned it on, and began yeah, backing out. And time. as he did, he looked over at the sedan and he saw the guy behind the steering wheel, the middle-aged guy, was looking over at Mark with that same menacing look on his face. Mark also noticed there was something odd about the sedan's trunk. There was a fist-sized hole right above the license plate where you would normally put the key inside of. So the whole scene was just totally bizarre. And after Mark and Kathy sped out and were back on the highway, yeah, yeah. Mark explained to Kathy that there were actually two people inside of that sedan and they really creeped him out. And that's why he had grabbed her and rushed them back into the car. And so she agreed that was pretty creepy. But by the time the couple got to the baby shower in Baltimore, they had completely forgotten about their experience at the rest stop. The baby shower went well. And before long, Mark and Kathy were back home in Ohio. About a week later, the couple was watching TV in their home when a breaking news bulletin came across and it showed a reporter who was standing at the exact same rest stop that they had stopped in on the way to Baltimore in Frederick County, Maryland. And behind them was the same late model sedan that they had seen parked at that rest stop when they had pulled in. The headline of this special news bulletin was DC snipers yep, caught. Yep. It would turn out that middle-aged man sitting in the driver's seat of the sedan staring at Mark was none other than John Allen Muhammad. And the guy next to him, the teenager yeah, who was sleeping yeah, was that, Lee uh, Boyd Malvo. These were the, the two men that were responsible. Was my bed, like, no, nah, the back of the trunk. 
Oh wow! I don't know if you, you, you heard about that? Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Both were highly coordinated three-week-long right. attack that left ten people dead in the Washington D.C. area. That's the fist-sized hole that Mark saw on the back of their trunk was what they used to shoot through because it allowed them to stay concealed in the trunk while they were shooting. Mohammed and Malvo had been using that particular rest stop in Frederick County as a place to hide out in between their killings. When Mark and Kathy pulled in next to them, they were only halfway through their killing spree. Mark believes the only reason he and his wife were not targeted is because the killers most likely were trying to keep this rest stop off the radar because it was their hiding spot, and so they wouldn't have risked an attack there. Although, ironically, they would ultimately be caught in that rest stop. Mohammed was executed crazy. by lethal injection in 2009, and Malvo is serving a life sentence. Jeez, bro, that's crazy. How old, how old was the boy? Like uh, 14 or something like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Exactly. In 1988, 35-year-old Ivan McGuire they was an experienced there. skydiving yeah. instructor with over 700 jumps to his name. On Damn. April 5th of that year, he was working in North Carolina, and he was tasked with filming other instructors and their students after they jumped out of the plane. The way this worked That's is Ivan would go up in the plane oh. with the instructor and their student, and Ivan would be the first to leap out of the plane. He would oh. roll onto his back, and he would film upward towards that's, the plane. That's and- sk- Bro, the type of balls you have to have to... Roll on your back yep. to film someone. You're falling. You just that dog. I couldn't. I woo. three inches. <laughs> I couldn't, bro. Bro, you ain't lying, dog. That that's is, that's a different level. Got it, bro. Of now we know, yeah, myth busted. Got it. And he would capture the student and instructor jumping out. That's and how they would continue that to film them until they pulled their shoots, at which point he would pull his. <laughs> now, being 1988, the filming equipment that Ivan was using was much larger and more cumbersome oh, than yeah. something yeah. you would use today. He had a voice activated camera attached to his helmet, and then from there, there was a cord going to this big, heavy VHS deck Sheesh. that he kept in a backpack. But despite the nuisance of the equipment, Ivan went up with the first student and instructor <laughs> and successfully filmed their jump. When he got back on the ground, Ivan went over to the riggers and he gave them his parachutes so they could pack it for him. And then Ivan went over to a bench and began fiddling with his camera equipment. It was clear he was frustrated with the way it was set up and he was making all sorts of adjustments. When it was time for Ivan's second jump of the day with a new instructor and new student, he was so preoccupied with fiddling with his camera that he forgot to grab his parachute. And so he ran over oh, to the plane no. and he's about to get on and they say, hey, Ivan, you're not wearing a parachute. And he okay. goes, oh my goodness, you're right. He runs back over, he gets his parachute, he loads back in the plane, oh, cool, he goes up to altitude, and then he jumps out, he films the instructor and student, it all goes great, he makes it to the ground, and his second jump is a success. Okay. And just like after the first jump of the day, Ivan takes off his parachute, he gives it to the riggers, and then he goes and sits down on a bench and continues to fidget and fiddle around with his camera equipment. When it was time for Ivan's third jump of the day with yet another new instructor and student, this time he grabbed his parachute, put all of his gear on, ran over to the plane, hopped on board, and he took off. Once they got up to their jumping altitude, which was 10,500 feet, Ivan turned on his camera, and the footage shows the instructor and the student kind of getting their gear together, sitting across from him in the plane. The jump master towards the front of the plane slides open the side door. Ivan, who's gonna be the first one out, makes his way to the edge. He turns himself upside down, so he's sitting basically with his back outside of the plane. He makes sure the instructor and student are right on top of him, ready to jump out right afterwards. Once they're ready, Ivan falls out backwards and continues to film. You see the instructor and student jump out right afterwards. Ivan continues to film them as they go down. They're in free fall for a few seconds. And then you see the instructor and student pull their parachutes, at which time Ivan reaches back to pull his own, but he can't find it. For a few seconds, he flails, and you can see his hands coming out in front of the camera, and he's trying to reach for his ripcord, and then he realizes what's happened. That parachute he grabbed before he loaded up in the plane was not a parachute. He grabbed his heavy backpack that had that big VHS deck in it. And when he put it on, he mistook it for the parachute. And so now falling at terminal velocity with no way to stop himself, he begins yelling out, oh no, oh God, no. And he keeps reaching back as if he's just gonna find this cord, but there's nothing there. And after a few agonizing seconds, you see the ground getting closer and closer and closer, and then it cuts out. Ivan's body was later found about a mile and a half outside of the drop zone in the woods. His camera and videotape were severely damaged, but they were able to splice it together. And that's why we know what happened in his final moments. An investigation into his death showed the pilot made the same mistake Ivan did. When he saw Ivan with that backpack on, he assumed it was a parachute. And so ultimately Ivan's death was ruled an accident. Fair warning, if you look into this case, you will almost certainly come across the actual footage of Ivan's final jump. Ah, yeah. 
Damn, Damn that's, that's crazy. Sad. First in peace, Robin. In 1980, Max. Bobby Shaffron was on his way up to Sullivan County Community College, which is two hours outside of New York City, to begin his freshman year. Even though he was from the area, he didn't know anybody that was going to this particular school, and so he was pretty nervous about it. Plus, he wasn't that popular in high school, and he had a hard time making friends. When he pulled into a parking spot at the school, he saw a sea of people getting out of their parents' cars and carrying boxes up to their dorm rooms. And so he took a deep breath, hopped out of his car, grabbed his backpack, and began walking across the lawn towards the dorm building. On his walk over, Bobby was surprised when he felt like all these random strangers on the lawn were looking at him like they knew him. And a couple people yelled out to him and said, hey, it's good to have you back here. And one girl actually ran up to him and kissed him on the cheek and oh. said, oh my gosh, I'm so happy you're back. Oh. And Bobby said, I think you got the wrong person. I, I don't know you. And she laughed and she just ran away. And so Bobby's oh, totally bewildered sure by this would. because he doesn't know anybody, but everybody seems to know him. And so he walks up the steps and he goes inside the dorm building. That's wild. And as he's walking down the hall, people are high-fiving him and patting him on the back. <laughs> oh, man, that's crazy. You just in there. What's good, bro? What's so good? What? I, man, what's Some out of a teen comedy. Hey, like, oh, I missed you. Mark. Who oh, are man. you? <laughs> no consent. <laughs> That's just crazy, bro. And then right as he's about to turn the corner towards his actual dorm room, someone down the hall behind him yells out, Hey, Eddie, what's going on, man? And Bobby knew whoever it was was yelling at him. Because this whole situation had been so weird, he felt like this had to be a case of mistaken identity. And so Bobby turned around and he saw at the other end of the hall, another student who he didn't know, clearly waving at him and yelling out, hey, Eddie, come here, what's going on, man? And so Bobby walks up to him and says, hey, I'm not Eddie. I don't know what's going on, but everybody thinks I'm somebody that I'm not, but I'm not Eddie. Who's Eddie? And the guy said, yeah, okay, Eddie, it's good to have you back here, Whoa. man. And then walked off. And so Bobby's like, what? <laughs> I must say, yeah, okay, people. Eddie. <laughs> Two people that told you, oh, you funny, Eddie, bro. You funny. That should have drive me crazy. I'm bro. like, bro, I'm not. Look at my driver. I'm like, bro, you you committed to the You're joke. You're real good. <laughs> well, I tell you, gotta love oh, your humor. Oh, good old Eddie. Pull him the fast ones on. Oh, <laughs> gotta love your humor. Go to class, uh, Eddie. So you're not going to acknowledge that you're here, Eddie? My name's not Eddie. I'm Bobby. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, get out, Eddie. I right. thought you were done with your shenanigans last What the semester. hell? All right, that'd be crazy. What is going on here? And so Bobby turns and he goes back up to his dorm room and he goes inside and he just shuts the door and he's thinking, I just want to be left alone for a second. Right. Because this is just, this is not right. Pretty weird. This is not how a freshman who doesn't know anyone gets welcomed at any school or any place in the world. This is totally unusual. And just a couple of minutes after being inside of his dorm room, he hears a knock on the door. And Bobby's like, oh great, who is it now? Who is it that thinks I'm someone I'm not? So he opens the door and there's another student who he doesn't know who's standing there. And this guy, his face just drains of color and he starts shaking when he sees Bobby. And they're both looking at each other like, what's going on here? And the student says to Bobby, were you adopted? And oh. Bobby said, yeah. And then the student said, is your birthday July 12th? And Bobby said, yeah. Whoa. And so the student goes, okay, what are the my name is yeah. Michael, and I am best friends with a guy named Eddie Galland, and you are his clone. You have got to be his identical twin. What? At this point, to Bobby, this almost made That's sense, crazy. but it was so crazy to imagine having some identical twin he didn't know about. And so yeah. Bobby asked Michael if he could go meet Eddie because he's got to be a student here. And Michael said, well, actually, Eddie decided not to come back to school this year, which is probably why everyone you talked to was so excited to see you because they love Eddie and they thought you were him. And so Damn. they're psyched to have you back. Oh, After yeah. talking for a couple of minutes, yeah. Michael tells Bobby <clears throat> that they have to go call Eddie and they have to set up a meeting so that Bobby Bobby can meet Eddie and vice versa. And so Michael and Bobby run outside to a payphone booth. They hop inside, they're crammed in there, and they dial up Eddie. And as soon as Eddie man, answers, Bobby old. grabs the phone and just says, Hey, Eddie, payphone. my name's Bobby, and everybody thinks I'm you. And then Eddie says, Yeah, I've been getting a lot of calls about that, too. And Bobby would later say that when he first heard Eddie's voice, he said it sounded like his car and they sped two hours to Eddie's house. Damn. And when they got there, it was the middle of the night and Eddie's house is the only house in this quiet suburb that has all the lights on. And so Michael and Bobby walk up the path towards the front door of Eddie's house. And right as Bobby is about to knock on the door, it flies open and standing in front of Bobby is his exact clone. It's Eddie. And Eddie's looking back at Bobby and he can't believe what he's looking at. I they are definitely identical That's twins crazy. and they That's both shit, immediately saw that. Michael would say That's after crazy, Bobby and man. Eddie just stared at each other for about a minute, know, they just started crazy, laughing. Boy. It was like they were total strangers, Yo! but at the same whoa, time, whoa. they had this connection immediately. I'd still be scared they knew they were related and they were laughing and they hugged and they just stared at each other. And Michael said anytime Bobby would tilt his head, Eddie would mimic it and vice versa. <laughs> 
Well, hey, crazy. bro, stop doing that shit. Hey, <laughs> hey, the Spider Man me. He's <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> <Dude>. You're you. <laughs> Right, uh, like they were looking at the same time. Yeah. Shortly after, this story of these two long lost brothers reconnecting found its way to Newsday, which was a prominent local newspaper in New York, and they decided they would look into it to see if it was really true or not. And so one of the editors had a junior reporter fly out and actually oh, yeah. see Bobby and Eddie face to face and see if it was really true that they were in fact Bobby. identical mm -hmm. twins. And as soon as this reporter saw them, they knew immediately that, yep, they're related. And so Newsday printed this totally heartwarming fairy tale story about these two long lost brothers reconnected That's after all crazy. these years just because of a chance encounter in college and everybody loved it but this is where the story went from amazing oh. to truly unbelievable friends of another young man living in the new york area named david kelman began telling david that he had to check out this newsday article about these long lost twins because these two twins look exactly like david specifically oh, they said you gotta man. look at these guys hands they are just like yours david david was known for having these enormous hands and a lot of the pictures of bobby and eddie in the news showed their hands and they too were enormous and so david finally picked up a newspaper and looked at a picture of bobby and eddie and sure enough he was shocked they looked exactly like him and then when he read the article it showed their birthday oh. was july 12th the same as his and they were born at the same hospital he was born at whoa and so he's thinking whoa. these are too many coincidences they Holy. have to be my brothers That's and so david crazy. called eddie's home phone number and eddie's mother picked up and she asked who was calling and david said hi my name is david kelman i was born july 12th 1961 and i'm looking at a newspaper article of two identical twins that look just like me and one of them is your son i think i I'm the missing third twin. After hearing this, Eddie's mom apparently dropped the phone and yelled out, they're coming out of the woodwork. So Eddie what? and Bobby went to David's right? house and as soon as they walked in and saw David, they knew right away he was one of them. He was the, the third twin. The and apparently within minutes of meeting each other, they were wrestling and laughing hysterically. Bro, it was that's fucking no, Why is not a movie, man? This should be a movie, bro. This should definitely be a movie, bro. Who are you gonna get to play each other? <laughs> that's, CGI shit. I that mean, is that's fucking crazy. wild. Hold. Jonah Hill can kill all these roles. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Holy Whoa. dog. It's like, even yeah. though they were strangers, they somehow already knew what each other and had an hell? instant connection. Crazy. David's family members that witnessed this first interaction said it was the most incredible thing they had ever seen. That, that it was just so wonderful to see these long lost siblings finally reconnected after well, all these years. More, Shortly after yeah. David realized he was the third missing twin, <laughs> Newsday did another story talking about how there was actually three missing twins that had all been reconnected and once again it was just this incredible cinderella story and Bro, now this insane. story went all over the world they were Hell on the yeah. cover of every magazine every newspaper they were on every talk this. show and everybody had the same Probably question the time, what we similarities did they discover you, and they would say well we all wrestled in junior high school and high school wow. we all smoked the same cigarettes we liked <laughs> the same food we had the same taste in women and on talk Damn. shows when they would answer these questions yeah, it was immediately clear yeah, that they all like, shared the same mannerisms and well, on the show they would routinely interrupt each other and finish each other's sentences it really they was like they were the ex. exact yeah. same person despite having been raised completely separate from one another the boys loved the attention they were getting they had become international rock stars overnight Facts. and all three of them were immediately so close they were best friends right away they moved into an apartment together they went out partying they met madonna it was Whoa, just this incredible time that's a flex oh boy that's a life that is a f and we talking about madonna back then oh that's yeah. a f that's oh, a flex, bro. True prom. That's a flex, That's stupid, bro. dog. Yeah. We, a long lost brothers meet Madonna. Right. Wow. <laughs> that's, that sounds like a but beginning that's, of a... That's just incredible. Just porno. <laughs> the bros meet Madonna. <laughs> triple threat. The like, triple threat. <laughs> triple twin threat. Like a version. <laughs> triple X. Them in their lives oh, and so they weren't asking questions about why they had been separated in the first place but their parents were asking a lot of questions Hell because yeah. they had not been told by the adoption agency that, that the boy they were adopting actually had two identical siblings they had no idea wow. so the boy's adoptive parents reached out to the adoption agency mm -hmm. which was louise wise services it's based in new york yeah, very yeah, prestigious bushes, basically man. the most powerful and wealthy people in new york use this adoption agency if they're going to adopt and so the parents reached out to them 
them and asked for a meeting so they could get some answers as to why their kids have been separated. And so the parents go to New York, they go into this meeting room with the top brass of Louise Wise Services, mm -hmm. and they and say, you know, like, did you separate our sons at birth this on is purpose? Why we don't know and this. one of the executives yeah. said, yes, we did, because it's really hard to place three children into one home. At which oh, point, David's adoptive sense. father lashed out and said, that's absolute BS. Yeah. If you had told me he had two identical siblings, I would have taken all three. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. agency stood by this their decision and said, that's the only yeah. reason it happened. And so sorry, that's all we can tell you. And so the Damn. parents were very frustrated yeah, and felt yeah. like there was much more to the story. And in fact, they felt like the agency was actually lying to them about why they had separated That's their sons in the first up, place. Yeah. But they couldn't get any more information, so they left the agency. And right when they got outside, Bobby's father realized he had left his umbrella inside of the meeting room. And so he turned around, went back inside, walked down the hall quietly so he didn't want to disturb anyone. And he opened the door to the meeting room and he reached in to get his umbrella and he looked inside and he saw the people he had just met with from Louise Wise Services had just opened a bottle of champagne and they were laughing and smiling and they were clearly toasting each other on a job well done. And even though Bobby's father did not go in there and confront them about what they were celebrating, he got the sense that they were celebrating having dodged a bullet, that they clearly had just lied to the families of these three triplets and they'd gotten away with it. And so between the parents' general sense that the agency was clearly hiding something and then Bobby discovering this champagne toast as soon as they left uh -huh. the parents decided they needed to get in touch with some lawyers to yeah. help them get to the bottom of why their sons had been separated and so initially a number of really prestigious law firms in New York were excited to take this case yeah, yeah. but shortly after they all contacted the families to say well actually there's a conflict and we can't do it anymore. And the mm. parents believed this was because the adoption agency, Louise Wise Services, and some of their more prominent and powerful clients yep. were pressuring the lawyers not to dig into this. That yep. clearly there was some secret that they did not want uncovered. Talk, and so bro. unfortunately, the parents hit a dead end and didn't know where else to turn to try to get more information. Mm. And so over time, they kind of just accepted that this is just the way it is. And as for their sons, they didn't really care that much because right. the way they looked at it, at least given. they had each other now. And so yeah. over the years, the boys continued to stay really close. They started families of their own That's and awesome. had lots of family get togethers. It was just a really happy time in That's all of their crazy. lives. And yeah, at some man. point, the boys actually went into business together and opened their own restaurant in New York called Triplets. And the okay. first year, yeah. it was extremely successful, did over a million dollars in revenue. But in the second year, the brothers started to fight with Wait. each other about how to run the restaurant. Uh -oh. And in many ways, this was their first major conflict. They yeah. hadn't grown up together. They had never really fought. And so now they're fighting over money and how to run the business and it got really Jeez, bad really goes. quick and they just could not come to any sort of compromise and so at some point Bobby left the business he said I don't want to do this with you guys anymore and apparently his departure just completely ruined the dynamic of the three brothers Eddie was the most affected by this fracture in their relationships all he wanted was for his brothers to be really close and for their families to spend time together and now all of that was in jeopardy and so Eddie started showing signs of severe depression and was ultimately hospitalized for three weeks oh, and then okay. shortly after getting out of the hospital he took his own life. Oh. This was beyond devastating for the two brothers and oh, the rest of their man. family. Around this time, a journalist named Lawrence Wright, who had always had a fascination with identical twins, found an obscure scientific article called Psychoanalytic Study of the Child. It detailed a New York-based study about identical twins that were intentionally separated at birth and then given to different adoptive families to be studied. Although it wasn't clear what they were actually studying or why they needed identical That's twins crazy. to do this research. In this article, Lawrence discovered all the babies that had been used in the study came from the same adoption agency. Uh -oh. The same one Smack. the triplets had come from, the oh, Louise Wise Services shit. in New York. And so Lawrence called Bobby and told him that based on this article, it seems like he and his brothers were used in a scientific study. That's Bobby and David up. were totally furious. They felt like they'd been treated like lab rats. They also Thanks. wondered if their being separated at birth had a negative impact on their mental health and that that might have contributed to Eddie's depression and untimely death. Lawrence wound up writing an article about this twin study he had discovered, and after he published it, another set of twins found out they had been a part of the study oh, and discovered shit. themselves. These two women were man. also struggling with depression, furthering the idea that the study could have led to irreparable harm to their subject's mental well-being. At this point, David and Robbie did not expect anybody to be held accountable for this study. Mm -hmm. Instead, they just hoped to find out why it was done, and what they were testing for, and what the results were. 
and so they began working with Lawrence to try to get those answers. They contacted Louise Wise Services, who did admit that yes, actually this was part of a study, but they didn't get any information about what the results were or why they did it. And so they did some digging and they discovered the guy in charge of the actual scientific study was this doctor named Peter Neubauer, who was this very well-known psychologist in New York. And so Lawrence managed to get an interview with this doctor, but the doctor basically said, I won't answer any of your questions and I won't give you any information about this study. And he never published his findings. Right mm. before the doctor died in 2008, he made sure the entire study was put under seal inside of the Yale University archives so no one could access it until 2066, which has what? led many people to believe that the reason he set it so far out was to something. guarantee all of the subjects in this study would have died oh. by the time it was made publicly available, cool. protecting his own legacy people and the people that were involved oh, in this study. In the recent documentary called Three Identical Strangers, Dr. Neubauer's personal assistant, a woman by the name of Natasha, she said the point of the study was to finally put to bed whether it was nature or nurture that made the person who they ultimately become. Basically, are your surroundings the thing that ultimately makes you who you become? Or is it just your genetic makeup that you're predestined to become a particular person independent of how you were That's raised? Crazy. And she said the results were incredible, that basically it has nothing to do with nurture. It's all about your genetic makeup, that we unconsciously trend towards specific behaviors and decisions, but we believe it's free will. We believe we're choosing to do certain things, but in reality, it's basically predetermined. And specifically in the triplets case, Bobby was intentionally placed into a more affluent household where his father was a doctor and his mother was a lawyer. And so they were very well educated and that was his upbringing. Eddie was placed into a more middle-class family with his father being a teacher and his mom being a stay-at-home mother. And David was put into a low-income household wow. where they were all immigrants, That's English sick. was a second language, and they just had this very small shop that wow. they had. And Natasha said this study demonstrated that despite these boys being put into different socioeconomic levels, it had almost no impact on who they ultimately became. She said she doesn't know why the study wasn't published, but she hopes someday it will be. Also in this documentary, a doctor named Lawrence Perlman, who was actually one of the researchers in the study that would actually make house visits to each of the boys' houses as they were growing up under the false pretext that they were there as part of routine follow-up for the adoption agency. And he went on record and said that the study was not just about the effects of socioeconomic class. It was really about the effects of different styles of parenting. He said in the triple case, each of the boys have been placed into their respective households after that household had already adopted another child. And that first child they adopted effectively became the guinea pig for this study Damn. where scientists would come in and they would study this child under the false pretext that they were there just following up for the adoption agency. But really they were creating a baseline of how do these parents parent? And then once that baseline was established, then the triplets were sent into their respective homes That's with the up, researchers bro. knowing Using full well how humans. they were each going to yeah, be brought up oh, with the adoptive father being the X factor. Bobby's father, who was a doctor, was rarely around, but he was devoted and loving to his son. David's father, who was the shop owner, was around all the time and adored his son and loved him unconditionally. Eddie's father was a teacher who was around a fair amount, but when he was, he was very strict and rough with Eddie and quick to discipline him and rarely showed any affection for him. And while Dr. Perlman does not come out and say that Eddie's relationship with his father probably had an effect on him becoming depressed and ultimately taking his life, there are many other people close to this case that believe that's exactly what it was that David and Bobby had a stable, healthy upbringing and Eddie did not. And so when he was faced with the crisis of the brothers separating, mm -hmm. Eddie couldn't handle it. These same people refute what Natasha said about the findings of the study that were all genetically predisposed to become a particular person. Mm -hmm. They say if that was the case, then why haven't David and Bobby taken their lives? But ultimately, because the study was never published, we won't know for sure why it was done, what they studied, and what the conclusions were. All we have is speculation and second and third hand information. But what we do know for sure is these surviving triplets and their families are furious that yeah, this yeah, study was yeah, done. Man. They feel like it ruined their lives. Following the release of the documentary, Three Identical Strangers, Bobby and David were actually granted early access to the study that was sealed inside of Yale University. And when they looked at it, they were expecting to be blown away with the results, but it turned out it was over 10,000 pages of very technical information, and much of it was heavily redacted, so they couldn't even read most of it. They were not able to deduce what the purpose of the study was in the first place, or what it accomplished. It was just all very ambiguous. This study was ultimately shut down permanently 
permanently in 1980, the same year the triplets discovered themselves. As for the adoption agency, Louise Wise Services, and all the scientists and researchers involved in the study, none of them were held accountable for their role in this totally unethical study. And so basically well, everything was swept under the rug. And so Bobby, David, and all of the family members of the triplets wow. were just wow. left with a whole bunch of questions and not a lot of answers. So that's going to do it, guys. If Holy you found a secret bro, that last episode, one, let us know in the comments what that it last one was. Oh. Wild, bro. That's oh, wild as hell. Jesus, man, to be separated just because of a study like that. Exactly. They're like guinea pigs. Like these are human, yeah. beings, human beings, bro. Man. Like just, that's wow, bro. And the fact that they was crazy. able to still find each other somehow, some way, they was able to find each other, bro. Like, that was God, man. Facts, man. facts, that's bro. Crazy, man. Jeez, that. Hey, Mr. Ballin, I'm telling you, man. You you on one, my guy. Like, his videos are very interesting. Superb. And uh, we definitely will be checking out some more from him. So be on the lookout for that, man. Great, great. Phenomenal at storytelling. Yeah. Facts, yeah. facts, 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 you sitting here not even realizing how many it is. I think people said, man, ever since y'all put me on, I've been going through all his videos. There you go, I'm man. Like, man, look, we're definitely going to do our best to go through each one that we yeah, can. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so run up the likes. Let us know if y'all enjoying them. Half as much as we are, man. Again, your favorite trio on the road to a milli. Yep. So make sure Thanks. you support us, man. Continue to spread love and be that same love out there, ladies and gentlemen. And never forget, fist up. Love you. Catch you in the next video. <laughs> The best is from Houston If you got a problem, then we got the solutions And there's no illusion I made this shit happen, I'm living life lucid I'm switching my strategies Now they hate on me cause I'm causing casualties But why are they after me? Deep inside they know they can't handle half of me